introductions, but firstly, just check, can, you, can everyone hear me okay? Is it, is it okay, does my voice carry sufficiently? Um, please, wave your hand if, uh, if you're not catching what, what's being said. Uh, we won't be, most of what we'll be presenting now will be coming from, uh, coming from us, uh, so you won't have to strain your ears for, um, for, for the video films. So my name is Phil Jarvis. I'm the, I've been leading this group, uh, the Save the Windmill group, um, since the pub shut in 2015. Uh, and uh, I've been supported with a, a group of uh, people both from Charlton and, and Hitchin and, and beyond. Uh, and I'll just quickly ask them to stand up and make themselves known. Um, Helen, <laughs> my wife over there in the corner. Um, Jess, who's been uh, running uh, Facebook for us. Uh, we've got Ben and Anne. Um, Ben's uh, been looking after the website, and Anne is uh, our secretary who's been taking care of minutes. I'm scanning the audience for, I know Koki's uh, here. There's Koki. Koki's there, um, a, a, a former Charlton resident who was uh, very um, supportive in the early stages of. Uh, our group and Derek, Derek Wheeler, I've seen. Thank you, Derek. Um, so, uh, Derek, a frequent visitor to Charlton on these dog walks. So, we're a group of just over a dozen people, um, as I say, a mixture of Charlton residents and people from Mission and beyond. Oh, no, I haven't mentioned Ian. Ian, where's Ian? Ian Richards, he's been downstairs. Ian and Matt are downstairs uh, showing people up. Um, yeah, so a group of um, both uh, Charlton and Hitchin residents that uh, you know, have, have, um, have, have been supporting us over the last few years. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit um, particularly about, about our group and how it's been working and, and the plans that we've, uh, we want to put to you. And then I'll be handing over to Bernard Lee, um, who's been our uh, expert from the Plunkett Foundation, who's um, carry out business analysis and someone with the experience that he'll be able to, sh to share with you on a, on a much broader level. Um, so as most of you know, this is what Wimbledon looks now, looks like now, and um, it's difficult not to pass by and get a sense of sadness and loss, and, um, and then for that to sink into a bit of despondency in terms of, you know, how do, how do we let this happen? How did, how did the community let this, this happen and lose uh, Wimbledon? But, it's important that we don't wallow in that uh, in that despondency and actually um, and, and draw some positive messages out of it. And not forget the fact that when the window was sold off the open market, um, other competitors and other uh, people that were willing to take it on and run it as a business weren't given the opportunity to bid. And um, the window has been, like many pubs uh, in this situation, has been caught in a squeeze between. Uh, the rising house prices and the, and the pressure for, um, for, for housing and the fact that breweries have been really changing their business. The way that the public use pubs has been changing over time and breweries have been moving to uh, premises where they've got much higher volumes of sales to be secured. So, um, you know, if you're, a, if you're a brewery and you are looking to, to, to change the profile of your business, you're not going to be wanting to sell your business assets to businesses that are going to pop up and then be competitive and compete with your business. So it's probably not a surprise that the, the, the windmill was sold in the way that it was, the fact that it wasn't put on the open market and that it was sold whilst we were in the process of getting an asset to community value recorded against it. But that's where we are now, and um, and that's not to say that this is a hopeless situation, because what we hope to get across to you tonight is that many pubs have faced the same situation, and with the support of the community, have been able to come back as community pubs. So this was a, a message that I got in the town centre from uh, somebody on Saturday, um, and it's you know to be frank, we've probably fought it ourselves. I'll believe it when it happens, and. Uh, and the response to that was really, well, it will happen when you believe it. We've really got to believe that it's possible uh, as a community. Uh, and things won't just happen without us putting uh, our own effort and support uh, in, into it. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's one of the key messages that we want to get across to you this evening. So how will it happen? Um, well, firstly, we need to, we need to put together a federal business plan. And in doing so, to take advice 
um, from maybe people that haven't got such a sentimental attachment to the windmill and are able to look at it with hard business eyes. And so we actually commissioned two business uh, analysis, one, one very early on when we were in the process of fighting the uh, change of use application, which was eventually withdrawn by the owner. Um, so that was right way back in 2016. And one more, more recently from Berlin, who will be able to talk you through that. So you obviously need a credible business plan, um, and that's focused very much on the community benefit uh, society and community pub model. Um, because this offers a different way of running pubs, um, and where it's not dependent on high volume, high profits, um, where in fact the, cost, the, the running costs are kept much lower um, because the, the, uh, the, the, there's a, a lower cost operating model in place. I, I don't want to go too much in detail about that because Bernard will, will be able to explain that to you. Um, but obviously um, it's a model that's very much uh, a two-way partnership between the community and the business. In that the, the community own the pub, um, they uh, have an influence in terms of how it's run, uh, who runs it, how they run it, and, uh, and that vision is really put into reality by the, um, the, the, the proprietors that are, are running the pub and therefore provide essentially what the community wants. Obviously to get something like that off the ground, we need to, we, we need to, uh, to, to, to raise a substantial financial investment from the community. So the target we've set within our business plan is uh, between 270 and 450,000 pounds. You might think that's a huge figure, but actually that's, in the scheme of things, when you look at what other community pubs have achieved across the country, it is possible. Uh, and you, uh, and um, someone said in that film, it's, it, they were surprised by the, the, the response that they got from their community. Um, it will happen with uh, support from the More Than The Pub programme because in addition to the money that we can hopefully raise as a community, we can also get financial support from the Plunkett Foundation and from other uh, community funding streams. So the Plunkett Foundation has a scheme whereby they will give up to £100,000 in a grant and loan package, um, evenly matched. Um, so that's something that's obviously very important to us and something that we will um, be able to access uh, once we've got the financial backing from the community uh, and, have, uh, and have negotiated the purchase of the pub. More on that to follow. Obviously it has, it has to rely, it has to be a sustainable business over time um, and therefore it needs the onward support from the community. Um, both in terms of future custom and actually using it, um, but also in terms of perhaps getting it off the ground. Um, so some community pubs have uh, been able to get teams of volunteers together, I think one of those was in the film just there, uh, who worked to get the, get the pub back on its feet, back up and running. So sort of practical help from, uh, from the community in terms of uh, being able to do some of that refurb and, um, and refit. So the More Than A Pub program um, that the Plunkett Foundation uh, manages um, and, and which many other um, both government and voluntary bodies um, pay in and subscribe to and, and support uh, is, is well, very much you know, what it says in the title. It needs to be more than just a pub. Um, run by the community and for the community. So it needs to be providing additional benefits for the community. And so we've looked at that in our business plan in terms of what do we will provide for the community? What does the community currently value the windmill for? And the, the key thing is its location. The fact that it's actually a gateway to the public, a gateway to the countryside. Um, people within the group of um, have, uh, have referred to it as Hitchin's Country Pub, uh, a place where people like to go out, have a, have a walk or cycle if you're a cyclist, uh, and relax with friends, uh, enjoy a drink. It's uh, very much a sort of go-to destination in terms of the environment it can offer. Um, so that's definitely a strength and something that we can, we can promote because it can promote healthy activities like walking and cycling. We can engage walking groups who continue to use it very much so in terms of the, the car park. 
Uh, and cycling routes, I think there's a cycling route that's actually named after the windmill, which is still in existence. Um, but really sort of building those, um, those links into the business plan so that you're actually drawing that custom base in. So that you're actually providing what cyclists want in terms of uh, you know, what, what refreshments they want now on their cycle rides. And the fact that you can actually encourage walks by providing guided walks um, uh, and advice on, on, on guided walks through the surrounding countryside. It needs to be inclusive, it needs to sort of reach out to parts of the community that maybe the Wingle hasn't reached out to in the past. And perhaps that's about using the facilities that we have there uh, in a more creative way, not just in the evening as a part of you know, a weekend lunch time, but actually opening it up to for community groups to be able to use and engage. I mean, I was at a meeting with Ian the other day at um, the Hitchin Business Buzz. Uh, they meet regularly at the, the Hermitage. Uh, and it's that sort of activity that actually we can promote and, and draw people to at the Windmill. Because it's a great location in terms of it provides uh, free car parking, it's accessible from Luton and Hitchin and other towns, uh, and it's a pleasant environment that people can use during the day. So there, there are those opportunities as well. Um, but also it's about getting the basics right in terms of the fundamentals of, uh, of a pub or a cafe or a restaurant. Um, it's about providing good service and good food, uh, a good customer experience. We've also looked at, in the business plan, uh, what's the future potential there for the, for the windmill? How can you unlock additional uh, features and, and benefits from that site that are you know, that haven't yet been achieved. And uh, you know, I don't think there would be many of us that have to be down there, sitting there, thinking, what a great location this is. You know, couldn't this be fantastic if you made more of the, of the river, um, of the river frontage, of, uh, and actually improve that, that, that area? Um, so, an another, uh, I mean, the, we've got a long list of, um, of ideas that people have, have, have put to us, ranging from, you know, pizza ovens in the uh, on the patio to micro breweries, but we've we've got to you know our business plan has got to look at what can be what can the future potential be. You know, is there space for uh, accommodation for Airbnb to make it a, a, a destination where people might come to for a weekend from London for, for only half an hour train journey from from the metropolis? So we need to play to the windmill strengths. Um, and I'll just run through, and I've probably covered a lot of those already. Um, yeah, Riverside location, the outside patio, the generous parking, uh, the fact that it's situated on a famous hip of way. There's a very important historic link um, between the Windwall uh, and Henry Bessemer, and, and the influence that Henry Bessemer had on the Industrial Revolution. Um, so, you know, a lot happened in Charlton at one point in terms of uh, what Henry Bessemer invented and, uh, and had an influence worldwide. So we can draw on that. That can, that can draw people into the location. It certainly, uh, you know, is an added uh, appeal. And of course, we've got to mention Charlton's uh, star attraction, which, um, as you all know, <laughs> So we've got the... Uh, which is the main, Rufus is the main war at uh, Charlton now, if you, I'm sure you know, many of you have seen him. Uh, and uh, you know, that's where people go to, uh, to, to, to visit the, and feed the pigs. I, I had to wake him up uh, early on for his photo shoot and he wasn't very happy about that. But, uh, I'm very grateful for the fact that Rufus uh, finally performed. He was, uh, he was uh, having a little bit of a sleep. Um, just to show you some of the things that we've been um, we've been working on in terms of um, developing future potential. Well, you know, one of the problems with Windmill was the fact that it was very small. It didn't provide an awful lot of uh, restaurant covers, as they're often referred to in in the trade. Uh, and um, you know, we need to maximise its potential with a, with as little cost as possible if this scheme is going to run. You, you might not be able to see the detail on there, but just to explain to you that we, we had an architect look at the existing floor plan uh, of, the, of the windmill and how, how the bar could be better designed. Um, the owner has uh, this currently gutted the whole of the, um, the pub, um, from literally from ground floor up to the rafters, 
um, and laid a, a new floor throughout the ground floor. But in some respects, that actually gives you a chance to look again and, uh, and, and look and see how, how the design can be improved. Uh, those of you that were familiar with the pub will know that the, the toilets were, were down at the river end of the building and, and sort of really you didn't get the best view uh, of the river. So that actually enabled um, that area to be opened up. These plans show uh, the toilets being repositioned where the cellar is. Well, you came into the window through the front door and the cellar was over in the, in the right hand corner that's facing you. So that could be where the toilets could fit and the cellar could be repositioned just outside in a, in a, in a purpose-built extension off the back of the building. Um, so it would be a nice open uh, bar area with, uh, with the main sitting area um, on the left as you come through the original entrance to the, to the pub uh, and with patio doors and opening out to the patio, the patio uh, and the patio itself is also an area which could be hugely improved where you could increase the seating. So we think there's potential there, just looking at the, the, the site as it is, um, just working with it as it stands at the moment without having to add um, you know, huge amounts to, uh, to, in, in terms of cost. So we've run those plans past the council informally. You know, we've, we've, we've spoken to planning officers, they've, they've taken a look at them, the conservation officers have a look at them. And they've said that you know, obviously subject to us going through a formal planning application, they don't see any problem with a development like, like that, and an improvement like that. So there's potential in terms of, of actually um, making changes like that uh, in order to get the pub back up on its feet, uh, which will effectively double the amount of restaurant covers that it had originally. Um, so, you know, that, that uh, Bernard, I'm sure, you know, tell you how pubs make money these days, and food is, uh, I'm sure, a crucial part of, of that. So just to tell you a bit about the, the structure that we've, we've taken with the Community Benefit Society, what that actually means, and how a share scheme could work, uh, and, then, and then I'll hand over to, to Bernard. So, a community benefit society is, uh, provides a legal, accountable uh, structure, and at the moment, um, that society is held by the four founder members um, who, who established it. So it's registered with the Financial uh, Conduct Authority, as it's called. And um, but once uh, it, and basically, membership is by purchase of shares. So when people purchase shares they become a member of the Community Benefit Society. So once we formally launch the set share scheme, and we're not at that stage yet, once we formally launch it, um, by buying a share, you become a member of the Community Benefit Society, uh, and you have an equal vote. Okay, it's a one person, one vote system. Um, the whole purpose of Community Benefit Society is that they're for the community, and, and the community benefits from them, it's not an individual investment scheme. So if people are looking at this as a way of making money from their shares, go up and shooting up in value, that is not how it works. Um, if there is a profit uh, from that investment shooting up in value, and if we got, uh, you know, if, if the assets of the business had to be dissolved and sold, then the Community Benefit Society, as a democratic organisation, decides what part, what charity within the community benefits from that. Your share investment is returned to you, providing a sufficient capital to return that, so your money is returned, but the profit goes back to the community uh, and, and therefore uh, it, 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 it's a benefit to the community. So in that respect, it's a, it's a win-win situation. So look at it as an investment in the community, not as a personal uh, investment. So as I say, it's initially held by the four founder members. Once the, the share scheme goes live, um, we, the, we, the clock starts ticking and we must have an annual general meeting uh, at which the founder members stand down uh, and all members of the society are open, can, can stand for, a, for election. So that's how it works. It's a very, uh, a very democratic and fair setting in which all members of the community are involved. So the statutory asset lock is, um, is essentially what I said in terms of uh, the fact that it's um, any, any 
profits are, are, are locked in as much as they must go to the community and not individual members. So community benefit societies have raised over 16 million in the last five years, which is a huge figure. And uh, it's a very common model for community clubs. When we looked at the various models, um, we thought uh, that that was going to be the best uh, in terms of um, how it could involve as wide a uh, coverage of the community as possible uh, and, uh, and secure the level of investment that we, we, we needed. So at this stage, we are asking you to provide a non-legally binding uh, uh, register of intent in terms of uh, the, how many shares you would be prepared to invest in. So we're not taking money at this stage. But what we need to do is to be able to prove that we have a level of commitment from our community to reach that minimum target. Um, so you would do that by completing one of the forms that we've uh, handed to you as, you as you come into the meeting, uh, or by going on the website and simply filling out an online form and just submitting it through the website. You can also download the form from the website and complete it and pop it in the post if you prefer. Um, interestingly, we were explaining this to people in the town centre on Saturday, and I think within an hour of getting home, someone rocked up on the drive with a form uh, committing to, uh, uh, to purchasing their shares. And uh, that was a really great, whatever that was, if you hear that, was a, a real boost in terms of um, uh, the, you know, the, the support we're kicking off. So the scheme is essentially open now. We've said it's from the 1st of July uh, with the most of the material we've put out. But actually, if you go on the website now, you can um, state what your intent would be in terms of purchasing uh, shares. So we, we, we believe with the valuation that uh, the burn has given us at this stage of what the windmill is worth and with the, the funding that we could secure from the Plunkett Foundation that if, if we hit our minimum target, we could then make a offer to purchase the windmill from the current owner. Um, and we would do, if, if we meet that target, if you give us that support, um, that is what we will do. We will get a formal valuation undertaken of the windmill as a pub, um, not as housing, but as a pub as it stands now, uh, and we would make a, an offer to, uh, to, to the owner uh, on, on, based on that valuation. What we know is it's likely to be turned out, uh, and, and this is typical from other community pubs in similar situations. Um, so what we would do then is talk to the council about the powers that they have uh, under compulsory purchase orders to secure a, a community asset that the, that the community is being essentially deprived of. So there's provisions under the Town and Country Planning Act um, that enable councils to take compulsory purchase action uh, where an asset, uh, where a, uh, a property or building actually is being withheld uh, and the community essentially need and want that. Um, so that's essentially how our scheme will work. We don't want your money at this stage, but what we do want is a, is a serious uh, a registration of, of, of what you would be prepared to, to invest. And on that basis we can then start the process going to get an evaluation undertaken and, uh, and enter into negotiations with the, uh, with the owner. That's, we'll let you off, because you're a former, uh, former public of the windmill pile, who ran it very successfully. We've got, we've got a name or something. <laughs> yes. Right, so, um, yes, as you say, part of that money from the Plunkett Foundation would be in the form of the loan. And that would have to be paid by the... Yes, sorry. The, the question was that how would we repay loans that are obtained on the uh, on, on, on the river? And the answer to that is we would repay them from the, uh, the rental uh, revenue that we would obtain from the new tenant. So the, so the the tenancy will be set at a rate that can 
payback loans that are secured on the property. <laughs> So hold that question because Vernon will be able to tell you much more about that model and how that works. Um, so you know the operational side of, uh, of running a community pub is something that is very familiar with, and you'll be able to be um, yeah, very good. So, can I just go through? Uh, well, actually, no. Now would be a good time for slides, and then I'll take you into a few messages of support from the community pub. Can you explain the legal position a little bit more? Because uh, obviously the pub's been sold. So yeah, so the question was why, you know, why having changed the pub, uh, made all those alterations, um, why is the owner not being allowed to do that and not return to the pub to its original condition? I mean, essentially, that's probably a question the planning department would be able to answer. I can tell you that he, we, uh, when we were aware that he was making those changes, we notified the planning department, and the planning department required him to submit uh, an application for retrospective planning permission. Which went, which initially was declined by the local planning department, but went to appeal and was granted on the basis that um, it wasn't substantially, uh, it, you know, they looked at it in terms of, I think they turned it down on the basis that, you know, that it contravened uh, conservation uh, area requirements uh, and that it took it away from being a pub, a pub and, and, and it wasn't felt to. Be significantly detrimental to those points by the um, by the planning inspectorate. So unfortunately, we did try on that one uh, and uh, were unsuccessful. But so currently, sorry, Ian, yeah. Yeah, the, from the planning point of view, it's not a list of buildings. So the planning department can't enforce reinstatement. It's a list of buildings that they can reach out to reinstatement. It's yes. It's still a pub. It's in limbo as far as the public situation. And so it can only be used as a pub. Uh, I mean, the other point we put to planning was uh, it's being used as storage because if you look inside, it's just got a building equipment. Uh, but uh, again, that they didn't feel that was sufficiently uh, was sufficiently. You know, they thought what was reasonable what was being stored there. If you think otherwise, then by all means, write to the planning department uh, and point that out because uh, you may be able to persuade them otherwise. Yes, um, no, at this early stage, if there was, has there been any indication from planning that if eventually it was a part, would there be any objection to sort of substantial changes to the building, maybe larger than Yeah, I'm, sorry, you probably came in a little <coughs> bit. We've, we've put in, uh, we've shown the planning uh, some plans of fairly modest changes, and they, they, they said there would be no objection to <laughs> modest alterations. Um, but they are very, very much on. Sort of you know, we're looking at in terms of you know what can we afford to do as a community to get it back on its feet. Um, the issue with the pub is that it's very sort of landlocked, in as much as when you come out of that front porch, you step onto highways land, and it is highways until the car park starts. So the, the pub doesn't own any of the land outside the front, its frontage. Uh, it has a small garden to the rear. Uh, and it's in that area that we um, we showed a small extension to uh, to expand the uh, to, to to put the cellar facilities out there. Um, you know whether or not you could you could extend more down towards the river. <coughs> yeah. To me, that seemed the obvious. Like for it to be a profitable pub with a large dining area, yeah. it seems obvious to expand that area yeah. towards the river yeah. as some sort. Of... I mean that that artist's impression. And, gives me an opportunity to thank Keith Orblow for doing that for us because they did that free of charge an absolutely fantastic um, piece of uh, visionary artwork but that shows a slight sort of extension there and also a first floor extension above the above the flat roof <coughs> ground floor piece so but yeah I mean we do think there is potential certainly in that in that area if not to uh, in terms of hard uh, you know extensions but actually using the outside seating area and using coverage for 
um, you know, in terms of uh, you know increasing the restaurant. But the, these plans actually show that you could double the the, uh, the restaurant covers within the existing floor area. Uh, um, okay. Any more questions before? I'm not sure, um, but Bernard will be able to tell you of experiences of compulsory purchase across the country. Charlie, you can ask that question when he comes to your yeah, I'll, I'll handle that if I can with questions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we've, got, we've got quite a few chairs dotted around, so come and <coughs> take this opportunity to come and sit down, make yourselves comfortable. Um, because it gets uncomfortable standing for a long period of time. There's quite a few chairs around here. There's one here, there's one on the end there. because there are a number of other community parks running successfully across the country. And, um, uh, and that one of the great things is, of course, you can ask them how they're getting on and how they managed it. Um, I'll just run through two or three. I won't, won't go through them all. But this is one that is within 15, 20 minute drive of here. Three tons in Gilden, Morden. Only just opened in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Village Walk Pub refurbished it themselves. So very similar situation in terms of a, a, a developer owner who was very reluctant to sell, um, but eventually that was freed up with threat of compulsory purchase by the local authority. <coughs> so the village bought it, re-established it, uh, got a young tenant couple in there, uh, a chef <coughs> wanting to make a name for himself, um, and um, uh, you know, You've got to go there. It's, it's, it's a lovely little pub. Very simple how they've done it, and um, and, and a very very um, good menu. Um, so uh, it can be done. And uh, there are just countless of other pubs that uh, have been through a similar journey. So that's the Abingdon Arms in Beckley in Oxfordshire. Uh, managed to get in the camera good good beer guide. Um, one in Norfolk, which I'm sure Bernard will be familiar with. Uh, so I, won't, I don't want to steal Bernard's time because I'm sure he can tell you much more about those pubs having been involved with them um, personally. So, um, so at this point, at this point, could you get some Bernard's back? Um, so I'll hand over to Bernard now. Um, so as I said, I'm very grateful for Bernard Lee who's been um, working with us through the Market Foundation. Um, Three things I know about Bernard. Uh, one is that, uh, and this is from other people that have told us about him. One is that he's, uh, he's got a, a wealth of knowledge. He's a very generous person, uh, and he's, he's been certainly generous with his time with us. And the third is that he's got an awful sense of humour. So um, hopefully he won't, he won't give us any English jokes. But uh, I'll let Bernard introduce himself and uh, tell you a bit more about his actual Thank you. Just well done to Helen and what a fantastic turnout. Good, good evening, everybody. Yeah. My name is Bernard, uh, Bernard Lee, uh, and I'm a, a British Institute of Gamekeeping trainer and consultant, which sounds very posh, but in actual fact, I didn't go to university. People say he's an expert, well, it's you're an expert because you've been doing it for 55 years, and that's true, but, uh, but you can be doing something wrong for 55 years as well, and I've met people like that. So, but I have the privilege of working with a lot of community pubs, uh, and uh, you know, we make a few mistakes and we got a lot of things right. It's not an exact science, running a pub is a complex business, but I just wanted to talk, first of all, a lot of you will be sat in this room thinking, you know, you win by the charts, and you know, it's been shot for God knows how long. Uh, it took us until 2015. It wasn't so popular. Charlie Wells came away to get rid of it. Uh, it's in the wrong place. It's, it was a hell of a lot doing to it. You know, if you went in to see a bank manager out about that, you'd throw you out onto the street. I just want to, you, you're not on your own. I just want to convince you that we've had these conversations lots and lots of times, quite locally in certain places, 
Uh, and I'd like to see the outcome of this because there's a lot of community pubs but not too far away who are doing tremendously well. So, uh, first of all, and by the way, I, I hasten to add, I'm, I'm from Barnsley originally, so if you don't know where the M1 still cobbled, and if you can't understand my accent, please shout up and then I'll try and explain things in, in a different way. So, East Anglia. Uh, community pubs. I got involved with them five or four years ago. At the same time, four years ago, if anyone can remember that far back, we used to have a parliament that worked then in the Wissing Oak section. And there was a, an MP called Greg Hall Holland who actually forced through parliament a thing that, that, that enabled, required growing companies and pub companies to offer their tenancies on a free of tie lease. Now this amazed us all because we weren't expecting it to get through, but it actually changed the face of the pub code. And the reason why he did that, he was quite worried because there was what we call revolving door tenancies all over the place. And we've probably seen some of these where there's a, a pub in the village and they have a new guy running it every six months and he, he goes bust and somebody else comes in. And there's quite a tyranny of the way pub companies were treating their tenants. So he got it in through Parliament that pub companies have to offer a pub as a free of time lease. And it's a huge difference. A, a, a small barrel of beer is what we call a firkin, it's nine gallons. If you're a tied tenant, uh, well, I won't name any names, but Green King and Adam would speak to me, but you, you, you'd be paying upwards of £130 for that. If you can buy it on the open market, you're paying £75 or £80 for it. See a massive difference there? And then you have to pay rents. And if you join a pub company, you don't have the protection of the Landlord and Tenant Act. That means they can increase, increase the rent when they, when they think you're doing pretty well. So it becomes a success tax. All these things change. So when the pub company realised that they couldn't, they hadn't got everybody by the bits and, and, and they had to play fair with them, they thought, well, what we'll do, we'll look for our high impact investments and we'll offload the rest of them. So lots and lots of problems, including your lovely window, closed down. And, uh, you know, bought by a property developer, there is absolutely nothing wrong with property developers that want to make money. Uh, and you know, that's a noble cause as well. But I happen to believe, and I hope you're with me on this one, when the last pub in a community closes, a little bit of that community dies. It's gone forever. And you now we've got a choice today, we can do two things about it. We can sit down and say, it's a shame. Or we can say, hang on, we're not going to stand. But that place is an asset of community value in more than one way, and it can be turned into a very viable business. I'll hope by the end of this presentation to, to explain how and why. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm not here to ask you to invest in things. Uh, it, this isn't a bank manager's investment, it's, it's a, an emotional investment. But let's look at it, first of all, uh, I do believe the Dunkley Foundation, who are a great not-for-profit organisation, who started off actually helping rural community farms. Uh, and shops to stay open by investing in them socially. And then they drifted into the pub game a few years ago. Uh, I happen to be the, uh, the chairman of the British Institute of Innkeeping for the East of England. It's a role where, it's one of those roles where if you're not going to a meeting, they've got you on and you're stuck with it for three years. <laughs> uh, and I had that uh, dubious uh, privilege. Uh, and the Plugin Foundation came to me and said, you know, drifting into the pub business, but uh, do you think we ought to get some practical advice on, on how these places can be run? And, and my thoughts were that, you know, lots of people dream about running a pub. Not many people dream about running a sewage farm, but if you don't get practical advice for either, you'll end up in the SH1T, so we can. <laughs> right, now off we go. None have failed yet. 90 pubs uh, in, in uh, by the Bunkett Foundation, 90 pubs, none have failed. I'm not saying that one might or all, but none have failed so far. And on my little parish, which is the east of England, these are the ones that I've been involved with for a while, so you see the same anyway. We have lovely, at the top of the list there, the King's Arms at Sheldon in Norfolk. For those who are not too familiar with, with the parish, Sheldon was just off the ATM, sort of two thirds after Ely and before you get to King's Lynn. So there's a, if sheep could drink beer, that place would be very busy. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, it had closed down two or three times. It had a tenant in there, a pub company, 
uh, remotely built tenancy, most of them did a moonlight function, uh, left the place with bad debt, and then it shut down, was boarded up, the usual thing. A chap rang me, uh, Dr. John McCourty, I didn't know him, Adam, he's become a friend over the years. He's a heart surgeon, or a retired heart surgeon now. And he said, Bernard, do you know anything about heart surgery? I said, not a thing. He said, well, I don't know a thing about running the pub, but I've got him in mind that we can buy this place and make it work. So we sat and we set up a doctor business plan out, and we had some ideas. He didn't agree with all of mine, and I didn't agree with all of his. But we came to a, a sort of a, a, a mutual understanding. And uh, with these supporters in the village, we've got for about four years now. We won the camera up of the year uh, two years running. And I think we're in, we're looking good for this year as well. It truly is a fantastic place. Just down the white road from there is the White Horse in Upton, and that's between Norwich and April, as if you're going to Great Yarmouth. But it's not quite a road home because it's not on the roads, and it's not quite a main road because it's not on the main road. But uh, Upton's a lovely village. And it's become a, a, a beacon of what communities can do because not only is the pub there now owned by the community, but the shop is as well. Uh, so much so, we opened three years ago. The Royal Highness of Prince of Wales actually came to open it for us. And what we've done there, or what people have told them have done, they had uh, members could have a card which they used when they bought a pint or a meal or anything. And at the end of the year, they got a bit of divvy out of it. They could go in on front, you know, before Christmas and have a meal and a pint or whatever. But they'd saved number one. And when Prince Charles came, they gave him membership number one as a, as a gift. And he said, well, actually, he didn't think I'd use this, but my two uh, kids live up at Shoulder, uh, at uh, the Hall, Harry and William, and he says, they drink like fish, so they'll be down and take one. <laughs> so, uh, so he was a very nice chap. And, uh, with everybody in the pub, and um, extremely knowledgeable about the trade. He has a, he has a, uh, a charity called Pubbers the Help. Now, I've done a bit of work for them, uh, and they are there to save communities and, and, and pubs. And, and he's knowledge about the pub industry, uh, which uh, I'm very worried about the closures. Just down from there, the Heron House at Harlton, which is just over near Cambridge, not far away. That was a closed down. The lady who owned it was felt she'd be so badly treated by the village she wouldn't even speak to anyone from the village. So I had to go in there with a stool and a whip and be a mediator. Uh, anyway, the, the village bought it. Without the help of the club, we just lived through our own investments and uh, it's doing tremendously well with the tenants in there. The next one down is the Maybush at Great Old Oakley near Harwich. If you look at Harwich, there's sort of a peninsula on the ground side of it. And there's a tiny little village and nothing else there, and that's, uh, that's Great Oakley. The reason why there's nothing else there is because it was a massive ammunition dump. So if anybody was pleased to drop the candle, uh, that, that part of uh, the Essex would vanish. Uh, the Maybush is a fantastic pub. It's run entirely by volunteers, uh, which is great in some cases. I worry about it myself because I think we can get uh, what we start with volunteer fatigue, you know, using the Pareto principle works where 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. So, and I wouldn't advise people to go down that route, but hey ho, we have a green man or two green men. The first one's at Topsfield. The green man at Topsfield is, is run by a chum who's a fellow pocket advisor who can't be here today, he's in Dublin, otherwise he wouldn't be here to support us as well. But Topsfield has become a village, become alive with the community spirit, because not only does it have a pub, but it has the shop, and it has a brewery. And now, would you believe it or not, it's got a vineyard as well. So that's Topsfield. <coughs> Closer to Cambridge, there's a very smart village called Falmere. I don't know if anyone knew of Falmere. It's, it's sort of an upmarket South Canada village. You can take the fish and chips over and there's violin case around there. Uh, the, the green, even the police station is ex-direct. The, the green man is, unlike most community pubs, it's high-end food driven. Uh, which, which sets us a, a, a separate to the rest of the line. Uh, the King's Arm at Pebmarsh, Sudbury, was, that was driven by a guy called John Flack. John Flack is our regional Euro MP, so he's probably looking for further employment when he tried to get the pub And he's done it very, very well. It's trained extremely well. The Lamarsh Lion, the Lion at Braintree in the Essex, the community raised 500,000. There is nothing at Lamarsh. Nothing. 
the guy, the Robert Ehrlich, is a lovely guy. He, he was formerly the Lord Lieutenant of the County. Uh, and he, he wanted to save it for lots of reasons, but it's where Constable and, and the other painter, who's the other guy who uh, suffered painting, they both used to drink and paint there. And you only got to look outside and see what you can use at the Star Bank. And that was going to be closed down and turned into housing, and it's now a thriving public area. A friend of mine from Sheffield runs it very well. The Cross Keys at Red Ravers in Norfolk. Uh, it's a lovely pub on the village green, place on a picture postcard, much like your own place, uh, and does very well. Uh, they drifted into it last year, and uh, they wanted to go high-end food, and that's not always the right way to go. Uh, and they insisted on having a chef, but they're on the third chef this year now, so uh, you know, it can be perilous to go that way. And so, uh, the box that Mary Boulder show, which uh, we looked at very briefly, that's run mostly by volunteers. They just have a professional dialogue to help them as well, and it's, it's trading extremely well. So that's just a look at a few around here. Uh, and if you have a fancy of a drive out to the event, and one thing they have in common, the people who are in there are absolutely delighted to show you around, and we would like to hear about your audiences as well. Just a few. Uh, about to be open, well, the three tons of Gilbert Moore and I had the pleasure of working with them from day one from the concept to it opened actually and uh, set it to be open. But we're not saying it's open yet, though, because it's sort of a soft opening at the moment, we're just dialing the wrinkles out. But it's only the other side of uh, uh, Royston Bodlock, it's just over that way, and if you get a chance, have a look at it. And that was almost a mirror image of your place. Beautiful, but not quite as pretty as yours, it had your ribbon on in my head. But, it had the usual reluctant vendor who was going to be over, his de over her dead body they were going to sell it to the, to, to the uh, <coughs> action group. So we, for a proper valuation, drove the business plan, uh, made an offer to them, copies of the planning department, and then we got all our ducks lined up, in other words, we knew that we had enough pledges to make a bid. And before we were allowed to sell it to us. So, shame, but there you go. The three horseshoes at Hallings Bumstead, which is sort of just to the East of Haverhill. Uh, that's going to be open in July, we'll just point to some before it. And there's a few work in progress. Somebody mentioned earlier, just uh, to touch on about uh, compulsory purchasing. Uh, I'll hand it in question, but, but in actual fact, that, the tree of Stapleford is under a CPO now. The, the, somebody bought it from Green King, doesn't want it. You see, if, if you bought a pub with a car park, you can build four houses on it around Cambridge. It's a life changing experience if you can do that. Unfortunately, these pubs are assets of community value, and the community know by you will want to use them. But what you can't do is just keep saying that. Sooner or later, you better put up or shut up, and we'll say, right, you know, let's have a little money, and we're going to have a go with this one. So, and the rail in, railway arms at Saffron Board, and that's interesting in as much as um, Charlie Wells closed it down. A strap was set up, which has saved the railway arms, uh, and they've been going for two years. So much so that Charles Wells has said, no, don't close it down, I will be on there as a pub. And, and, and the, the action room, they said, no, the hell you will be not open. And we the lights up, we're going to run it, because we can see much more possibility for this as a community pub than, than we can as a Charlie Wells managed house. So that's just an insight into where we are in this community. We haven't lost one. I won't make sex all, all fair trade, all plain sailing. We've had one of about six students now, it's got bitter on ales. But they're all trading very well, they're all showing And then there's this one at the bottom, the windmill charter. Well, you're going to tell me whether you can say that one or not, and how you'd like it to be. So, if you don't mind, I'll handle questions right at the end. Is that, is that okay for everybody? If you manifestly disagree with something, please shout it out. And, um, right. So it all starts with the realistic business plan. Doing a realistic business plan for a pub that's been shut down and there's no historical trading data for it, you're not quite sure how many investors will be, is one of these things. We do sticky finger in the eye. Which strangely enough is exactly the same way that pub run group such rents. They call it fair intended trade. So they say what it would do. And sometimes what they say it would do is in, in the realms of uh, Fantasy Island or Love Island. Uh, so uh, it starts with a realistic business plan. Now, we'd urge us to have a realistic business plan, and I've taken a, a very brief stab 
at uh, <coughs> the business plan for this, but that's all it is. It's a business plan pro proposal and nothing more than that. When I first sat down, I was invited to Phil's lovely house over in, in John. The first question I asked everyone is, now what, do, do we want a restaurant that serves beer or do we want a pub that serves food? And the unanimous reply given the pub that serves food. So you can refine that down. Do, do, do we want to be doing Lark's eyelashes on beds of foie gras with truffle oil, or do we want to be doing bags of mashed fish and chips? Well, you know, it, it was more on the traditional pub type of food. Now, a place like the, the windmill, it's going to be really a, a subsistence living for the tenants or a, a couple there. A couple will get plugged in and work hard there. And I used to be a, a free household. And my wife and I know just how hard it is because we used to work 70 hours a week each. We bought a place for 170,000, sold it for 750,000. Can I do a Boris thing at the same time? Yes. have too many staff, they're going to get paid whether the place is busy or not. Uh, and you're going to have all, loads and loads of problems. You need to be able to, the company needs to be taking 15,000 or 15,000 a week before you afford a manager. And then you have to give him his employment settings, you've got pensions, then you have to do his tax and all his stuff, tax and things like that. It is an administrative nightmare. And you employ managers to run busy pubs. What you really need for this place is somebody who can make pub busy. And there's a great difference there. There's somebody who's going to figure out, and there's some very good tenants around. And, and I'll tell you a fine as well, if you, if you want. But there's some good tenants around who can make pub busy and be glad to work hard. So they need the protection of the Landlord and Tenants Act, that's something they wouldn't get if they were in the company. And they need freedom of time, and that's something they wouldn't get if they were in the company. Now, there's nothing wrong with pub rooms, they're there to make money, that's what they are. But I found a good way to find tenants is to say, I've got a beautiful pub by the river. And you go and look at the best operators there are around the area. And you say, I've got this place and it'll be, you know, 25% less rent than the one you pay. Plus the fact you can buy beer for 50 pounds and turkey cheaper. And you can have security tenure so you can stay there as long as you want to. And we'll give you an undertaking but we won't increase your rent more than 10% of that take. Do you know anyone who might be interested? And it's surprising how people sort of get, get uh, alerted to these things. And that's how you find the tenants. Anyway, moving on. The lessons I've learned so far, and, and I must admit, you know, having been in the trade 55 years, I was a bit cynical about it. I think being a community man, um, best law bill of now get on with it. I've completely changed my mind. I, I see people bring ideas that I would never have dreamt of. You know, you see, because folks who aren't in the pub business see the thing differently and come up with great ideas. Uh, King's Arms and Shoulders, just the one at the top of your head. They have libraries every fourth Friday, I think, and the place gets packed. But, you know, I play a bit of a guitar myself, don't encourage me. Uh, but, but I do, and, and I know, you know, if you get a booking somewhere, you go and you sort of set up at four o'clock, and then you wait till about nine o'clock till you want them to play in there. You do them two hours, and then it's not until you're happy to go home with everyone wants to do another two hours. But there, they, when they book entertainment there, they say, right, we're only here at four o'clock. We want all the mums and the kids to come from school. And then you can make a for the same gosh, which is a very high ticket, but just one that I would have thought of. But there is lots and lots of, lots of good ideas. In there. So the lessons learned. Community pubs are a much better place. So communities are a much better place than a good pub. I haven't met one community who said, I wish I'd never bothered you. You know, the April, the one there at Upton, the estate agent who lives in there uh, is a big local estate agent, and he's a big stopper. He said, can you find property for them in, in this village? Because we want to live there. 
because they're such good players. Incidentally, state agents are all in the same thing. A good poser in the area puts between 10, between 5 and 10% on the price of your house. No, I'm saying the prices aren't expensive enough around here, but there you go. Uh, community pub needs your support. There has to be a narrative about it. It's not just about making money. It's not just about hard money's investment. You know, we have great arrangements where if somebody's got a pretty pub, which the windmill is like, well, it needs lots of hanging baskets and the gardens need to be kept trim and all that. And that, and the business plan, you would put in like 5,000 good years. But if the community come along and says, look, we've got lots of people who are retired, we want to be a pub, and we'll do that for you. What we do want for you is that you in the main room, the coffee morning, and we want to do a, a film show in the afternoon for people who are able to get out and things like that. So as long as there's that narrative between you and this cooperation, it works really well. You know, people are a bit scared about having a tenant rather than a manager because a tenant leases the business, or rents the business, and, and, and makes their own property. But anyway, we'll, we'll deal with that as we go. So there are currently ten, ten in my parish in the east of England. There are ten community pubs that I've dealt with. By the end of this year, there'll be fifteen. Uh, all the communities are absolutely thrilled to bits uh, that, uh, that they've done this. There's lots and lots of local and national support. The government have just put 2.2 million into more than a for the third year running to help people. The Plunkett Foundation will give 50,000 and then alone with 50,000 uh, as well. But your local council, pub is the hub, these people who value the, the benefits of the community society. And this was summed up to me at Hilton Morden the other week because they had a volunteer there to sort the garden out. And I went to tell them on the streets, well, not that I know anything about gardening. <coughs> But what was interesting to me, there was people there who were kind of mowing the lawn or doing a bit of paint on the shed, and they were all talking to one another, and some of them were neighbours and had never done that before. And I thought, what a fantastic thing. And that's what a community pub is. That's what it's about. So the decision is yours. Uh, it's, thank you very much to Phil for the invitation, and, and good luck with it. And I'm more than happy to take any questions. What I did is a very rough business plan, and it is a very rough business plan. And this was based basically on a couple who were running it themselves with a few bit of stuff. And I would advise you, I heard a, a bit of a shadow went through my system when he was saying, well, we've got that information back in three times, just making all that. Let it evolve, would be my advice. Let's get it up and running. Let's go. Nothing fills a pub better than a crowd. If it's, if it's, you know, if it's boiling, boiling in there and all that. And, it, and it's, how it works is, you know, if you're pretty awful, that's it. If you, if you do, you know, only warm sausages up and do uh, what we call, Jamie and Oliver's used some stuff, so what we call freezer to geezer food. I noticed when poor old Jamie Oliver's company went, and I know he's died a lot, when he went bust, the biggest creditor was Break Brothers Frozen Food. I thought, well, that's, you know, that's a bit of a bit that was about that. Nowadays we have great aspirations and expectations and we're not going to be fucked up with freezers and geezer, but neither do we want to lock eyelashes on beds at the corner of the room and drop them out. You know what, we've, I did a survey with the British Institute of Beekeeping to find out what people really did want when they go to the pub. The first thing quite surprised me, because the first thing, the number first, when, you, when you gave people like a blank piece of paper, it's 21 people, was it? Number one was, Clean toilets. <laughs> Number two was good beer, not massive choice, good beer. And the third one was uh, good wholesome, wholesome home cooked food. And when we narrowed that down, it was bangs and mash, fish and chips, all the big pie, and uh, maybe a snake, but then a couple of, you know, off the wall dishes as well. But that's what it was. But we want the simple things done well yeah. rather than out of the box. Yeah. So that's where we were. I, I worked it out on, uh, you know, if, if a pub's bad, not very good for me to do about 10 meals a session, about 40 sessions a week. It's pretty good. Slightly above, you know, getting up towards average, it'll do 20. If it's very good, he's got a tenant in there, and he's going to do 30. And the Parisian principle here works again. 75% of the business is done between Thursday and Sunday evening, and the rest of it's sort of a bit low. But by being skillful and, and looking at the various demographics and using the pub, you can have that up. But a pub doesn't want to be just that. And, and 
I'm making a list of some of the things that I've seen and we've supported as well, or probably that I've supported. Uh, the first one was a book exchange where, you know, when you've read your uh, novel, you, you tell your partner, so I don't really want to go to the pub tonight, but I promise you, let's send me a book back to the library. <laughs> <laughs> but I have, there's about 10 of these in our community pubs, and we have a request, no more Fifty Shades of Grey, please. <laughs> Homeworkers Association, and that's where you find out who's around you. you don't, in the, in the days of technology that we live in now, uh, you, if you, a lot of people work from, work from home, I, I work from home, and you can find you don't speak to a human being or maybe on Facebook, for example. And when my laptop broke, which it did with, with, with annoying uh, regularity, I would put it in its case and go to PC World in Cambridge, and stand in the queue, and, and speak to a guy who <coughs> didn't look like he was old enough to be our without his mum, who spoke in a language that I couldn't understand, and then he charged me 50 quid for pressing the button. So I started a homeworkers association in, in Duxton, where I live. And we go to the pub once a, once a month and have a coffee in the morning. And I find out there's a computer expert that's across the road from me who can do that. But there's loads of other people as well. And that's such a good thing to have. Two reasons. One, you get to meet other people. Human beings. The, the trouble with our laptops and phones and things like that, you know, it takes people. People who are miles from us can bring us close, but it also takes us miles from people who trust us at the same time. You know, it's just expensive. The Good Thing Foundation, now lots of us, including people like myself, who are just about to be 75, don't fully understand IT. There's a government organisation called the Good Things Foundation, and they will send people along uh, once or twice a month, completely free, uh, and the pub is where they like to meet people for a cup of tea. People who are my age, they will show them how to use IT. You can scribe your granny in Australia if you want to do, uh, and, and also you make sure they're not being ripped off or, or what have you. And that's such a good thing, and it's very inclusive. So that's a good thing. So I found a cycling club. My wife joined a cycling club. I have to lock myself in the water and mash it up. And these things are free. The Breeze, the British Cycling Club. Walking groups, you know, I would recommend when we get the pub open that we put a few walks on the website. So people Village Cinema, uh, obviously the hub will help you with uh, funding for a big screen drops down and, and uh, projector and you can do it. So especially for people who are starting to get Alzheimer's or something like that, no joke, uh, you know, to show an old film that they can remember as well, for free, it's a huge possibility. And it also works very well for the rugby. I've been watching the latest soccer as well, which would be nice. Sometimes a shop, now we used to say three, four, five years ago, and that's probably shopping for it's a very thing if you stand outside most pubs now, you'll be knocked down by centuries.com or tesco.com. So it's maybe not such a good thing. But a village barber is a great thing for your bottle of milk and your bread and your bits and pieces that you need. And you think, I'm not going to go out and I'll just go to the pub and I'll have it there. So a village fridge is a, is a great thing. Live music, don't encourage me. I, I'm, they, say, they say the mark of a gentleman is somebody who can play the bagpipes and refrain from doing so. Uh, unfortunately, I play the guitar badly, and I'm never afraid of doing it. So, uh, the local history was Light Theatre. The uh, creative arts East will sponsor pubs for life. You could have Shakespeare by the river, and it would only cost you 100 quid. I mean, it's so good how they do it. I mean, it's something <coughs> different, and it's such a good pub. Uh, sewing clubs, stitch and bitch, as we call them, people can get together a lot. Of, lots of other got room for that. Pop up afternoon teas are amazing. Been invited to one or two, but I'm surprising how much Prosecco it is in, in, in the form. <laughs> For coffee morning, pub quizzes are still great. Uh, some pubs will have a competition to do with the Guardian and the Times Crossroads on a Sunday evening or something like that. And it's in Star Wars. It gets a good uh, Barbecue and barbecue hire works tremendously well. And where a lot of the pubs, uh, you know, <coughs> King's on the shoulder, it's wrong, the mate which is the one where the busy 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 is doing some lunches. And there are a couple of teams there, one's a cricket team, one's a football so soccer team, we come back after the games. So they say, look lads, this is it, we want you to come back, but we can't be doing some lunches and sandwiches for you, we'll pack the full. So but you, there's a barbecue outside, you can use it, and we'll get you photos of things and charge you cost plus 10%, which is basically what the payer says for us. You see these guys not printing them out on the market, so you get 
22 people come back from the football team and all, and all the girlfriends, and the same thing for the cricket, which could be on both sides of the girlfriend. So that's a good one, just to let the music. Uh, for the cost of a gazebo, which you can see about that's 50 quid, you can get from the farmer's pocket market, which is a good idea to go down and see what's fresh and, and buy it at a sensible price. Microbreweries, there's a lot of microbreweries now. <coughs> Some are good, some are not so good. And, and I would say, if you're going to go from this one, have a few what I call Me Too brands as well. <coughs> you know, you need a Guinness, you need a, a, a probably a, a Prodi or a Carlsberg or something like that. Uh, what I did, when I started with this, because <coughs> most of these pubs have been driven by committees and committees who didn't come from the pub experience. So a lot of the buying for the pubs had been sort of unstructured. There was a bit of this and a bit of something from here, some people from there, and all that sort of thing. So I looked at it and said, look, lads, I used to be the National Guard salesman for Courage Man, and I know how much we value the national bias. So for my youth this section, I wrote a very posh letter to Green King, Masters, and Adams. One of them didn't come back. One of them made a derisory offer to supply these and the criteria was a few things. One was there's no contract. We want an extra pump for our revolving micro brewery. We want very good service. We want our cellar refrigeration and our equipment servicing. And we want a price that can guarantee us 70% gross profit, charge the ordinary price to price. One of them came back to me. Did you notice which was in your drawer when you went to the next That's the one. So it can be done. I, I would have said it was around 120,000 wet, 120,000 uh, uh, food. Somebody sent me an email, thank you very much, uh, a couple of days ago, and said, how did I arrive at that? Well, I arrived at that looking at the ones we've got already and trying to get a clearer image. It's virtually impossible to get an accurate picture of what the pub would do, <coughs> other than it won't do less than four or 5,000 quid a week. It'd probably do much, much better. But pubs are only as good as the people who run them. And to get good people, you've got to fire them, and you've got to offer them a good deal. It's no good trying to rip people off. Pub groups have done that, and you've seen the standard of tenants that they have in there. You want somebody who eats, lives, breathes the women, loves it, he's happy to be there. You know, it's going to be 70 hours a week for him and his wife. And, and, because, and I happen to believe, you know, I love pubs, and I used to love running pubs. Uh, and I realise I'm too old to do it. Every time I look at a pub for sale, my wife says, well, you, if you want to, you write to me and let me know how you keep it. She says, <laughs> too old for it now. But, uh, you know, you, there are people out there who would like to remember a pub like the It's beautiful, nice. Right? It's a pub that you'd like to live in. So you're looking at the destination house, uh, and it, it, it's a lifestyle opportunity for some tenants, but I don't find a way to So, uh, you know, I looked at it. I, I also did a little thing on the business plan where I, you, you look, I put quite a provision for accounting and stock taking. Now, the reason for this is I've learned, because I had six pubs of my own at one stage. And it used to make my blood boil when I went to walk around on the house, and the, the licensee was to know behind the bar. Cold at the time, I didn't think it And he's, if he's doing his factors, or he's doing his meals. Now, I don't know about you, but. Did, did anyone here ever go in a pub because it has neat player team tools? We don't. The sale of a pub manager, a pub licensee's job, is a sales job. You've got to be out there selling the products and finding out what people want and testing the quality of, you know, of, of the experience. There has to be a greeting when you went through the door, and there has to be a thank you when you walk out of the door. But the best fertilizer for a farm is the farmer's books and the best. The, the best way to make a public is for the landlord to be there and tie himself up with doing some VAT and then I see the world. So I'll shut up. Thank you for this week. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, well, let's have a Okay, thank you for bearing with us in the heat and um, we'll throw it over to you if you've got questions at this I stage. Should, I should mention, I was too close to my guitar after the fire over the years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question everyone's got for me. Yeah, what pricing policy do you envisage for the winter? What pricing policy? Yeah. Yeah. What pricing policy? Yeah. It's an interesting, what we did, I looked at... Yeah, yeah. 
when when Phil, I, I, I might have that information, but I'm just bear with me a second. But when Phil asked me first of all to come and have a look at the thing, obviously it was closed down. But to get a real, to get an effective pricing policy, you have to look at one or two because it's not what you buy it for; it's what the market will actually stand. There are no marks for being cheapest. In fact, I wouldn't do that. You know, I would I would be in in the middle of the ground somewhere. And if I, I made a note, I'm not sure if I've got it with me. Uh, now look at this. The average price for your area. God, this is a bit of luck, isn't it? <laughs> IPA was 380 or a similar session beer. Abertail and the Green King Pub went in the series to it was four pounds a pint. Uh, and uh, they had another one at 380. Uh, Peroni was five pounds fifty a pint. Uh, that's all right. Is that what you were referring to, the, yeah. the beer pricing? Yeah. 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 Guinness was 440 and uh, Aspel's uh, cider was 420 Now, that would give you, if you went with something like Adnams, uh, not for all of it, but for a, a, a like, like, if Adnams get a fair bit of it, they'll look after all the equipment and everything. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and that's an important thing to have, to have a good relationship with the group. That would give you 70% gross profit percentage. A normal tenancy is very lucky if it gets 50%. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, question down here. Sorry. I'm with you absolutely on this one. I've slept by share. Um, the weakness seems to be the position with the present owner. Mm -hmm. Now, you're relying on compulsory purchase, no. No. Um, and it's been used on various occasions. But I'm guessing that the council could not use compulsory purchase no, no. unless it was necessary to fulfil a council policy which is expressed within, say, the local plan. No, you're absolutely so what is the position in the local plan about that sector? What I advise us to, and this has worked, this is what we do. When we have the reluctant vendor, and you get reluctant vendors because they want to, uh, you know, they want to uh, make a big killing on, on putting houses on the car park, things like that. What we do... Okay, so, so uh, sorry. So what we do is this. If there are enough people involved, enough, if there's enough inertia from this meeting tonight to give Phil an idea that, yeah, we've got to go here, then we'll commission a Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyor, I'm not one, to come and give us a valuation. And based on that valuation, we'll make him a written offer without prejudice to our rights, copy to the planning department. Now he knows that we've got him by the thing is. Because whatever there's an a good offer on the table for that place as an asset of community value, he can't sell it as a building block. How much do you pay for it, do you I don't know, but it could be you can actually access that information. I don't know if you can find out that information on I mean I think there's an online price. Of three hundred and twenty thousand, does it have? In actual fact, it has damaged the property. So you know, whether you want to make one yes. less. Yes. Question here, and I'll come up to that. The, the Barnacle Pub in Hitchin is in a similar slight, situation. Slightly similar situation in that it got community asset um, status, and then before we knew it, we saw it developed into flats. I'm wondering, do you know what the experience was there? Um, why that? Why that never developed into a community-owned pub? No, um, I, I would imagine. It, it, you know, obviously they were successful in getting change of use through the planning. Um, yeah, we what we know that. with the windmill is that it's a diff planning rules will apply slightly differently to it because it's the only community facility within a village. It's within a conservation area. It's within green belt, so it has a certain amount of protection. The asset of community value also gives it a certain amount of protection. Um, and we know that the owner has not gone back for planning because the original change of use application was resisted with over 2,000 written objections. Well, what I'd say in, in the North Living of Arakan when they say you've got to get all your ducks lined up, in other words, you've got to, you've got to say, are we going to make an offer or not? And then if you, because he can be saying, well, these people are talking about, they've been talking about it for three years, but they've never been, I've not seen the colour of the money. So we need to get our ducks lined up and be in a position to do it. You must have another John Marley calling Ducks, wouldn't you? I agree. I said I'd come to the gentleman in the back.
Shepherd in Cambridge, where and there's a star at Lydgate, the fantastic pubs. But what's happened there is the pubs closed down, and like five families have written a cheque out for half a million between them. And it does it, does the trick. But to me, it doesn't work as well as a community one because a lot of people, the star at Lydgate used to be a great pub, and Rick King decided to offload it because it wasn't big enough. All families of the village have bought it. And the rest of Lydgate think it's a private drinking club for them. It, it no longer has the same cachet that it once had. And there's a few like that with the ancient uh, shepherd in uh, San Vincent's the yeah. same thing. I mean, with the Red Lion, that's been a, a very well-established pub that was bought, you know, back in the 70s, I believe. You know, I remember it. Sorry? <laughs> really, 50 years ago. When community benefit societies presumably weren't in existence. So, you know, I think the village probably did what it needed to do at that stage to, and it's, it's run very successfully. It's, it's obviously not the model that we've looked at because we haven't got that level of investment within a, a very, Charlton is just 30 households. So it's, we're, you know, we're, that's why we're looking to Hitchin as being, this is Hitchin's country pub. We, you know, that's, that, that's where we think the, uh, the, the, the commitment needs to come from as, as people amongst the village. The other bar that one that you mentioned was yeah. the one that I had retired and went to live in Duxford and I used to go to a pub called the John Barbican. It was lovely. They went down one night and it was shut and boarded up. And it, it stayed shut for a year. And I said to Green King, because I'd never had a tenancy and never wanted one, but I said to Green King, shut my pub. <laughs> and he said, well, come on, Bernard, you, 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 you're the chairman of BII, you can live a I said, well, I will, but let's, let's have a deal. So they wanted a uh, big rent. Tell me how much rent, and I said, you're more than wise used to get paid for making people laugh. You're doing nothing. Anyway, the gave it for three years for 30,000 a year. Uh, it had never taken more than 8,000 pounds a week, and we did, do, we did nothing but the simple things properly. And we were taking 22,000 pounds a week, and it still is. So I'm very pleased with that. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, here. Uh, with regards to the problem here, uh, there's a few Research ideas showed you were only giving 70 million, and now we're reducing it to 35 because of the demand. Well, they've only, they've, are they on those figures correct? No, they only just got 2.2 million through one the pub last week. Now, I, I'm not the plan kit man for the investment side of it, and, and my friend Alan Collard, who would have been here tonight, is the plan kit advisor, and he's in Dublin. So. I would imagine that was, the figure was reducing because their budget was coming to an end, but they've just been given another injection. Yeah, but we're just now. Yeah. They've certainly tightened up their their criteria, um, but I haven't heard that they've that they're still quoting that figure of fifty thousand and fifty thousand. I got an email on Friday. Okay. I, just... I, I got an email on Friday afternoon from uh, from Tasha. From, from Going on the bottle of something, we've got 2.2 .2 million. Mm. So, I mean, we are in contact with Plunkett quite regularly and talking to Tasha Bev and, and people like that. And the, the indication I'm getting, anyway, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the indication is that they are seeing us as a, a potential community pub for the coming year. So, uh, 
the, yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely on their radar. So, I, I mean, you know, but I guess it's always going to be dependent upon what level of competition is from other, other providers, but they're, they're certainly taking us seriously. Another question here? Thank you, because that's probably what I wanted to say now, really, is just to recap where we are now and what we need from you. Um, Am I done, Mr. Sorry? Am I done now? Yes, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, Bernard. Um, <laughs> so, to be absolutely clear, this is sort of a really crucial point. It's almost an acid test, really, in terms of do we have the level of commitment from the community to fund this? So we need you to uh, to complete the register of interest forms and to specify what level of investment you would be prepared to put into the blanket and to spread the word amongst people who haven't been able to be here today and to uh, in order to get them on board as well. Um, we've said that we'll run this for a period of a month and we will get, keep you updated through that period as to where we are in terms of hitting that target. At the end of that month, we'll take a we'll take a view as to where you know where, how how have, have we done and do we need to continue? Uh, do we need to set another deadline? But we think you know initially we need to set the focus to people to complete those forms and to let us know what they would be prepared to commit to, and then we essentially do the sums. And if we have hit our, our target, um, then we'll obviously communicate that with you, and then we take it on to the next stage, which is to get a formal valuation undertaken. Uh, of, the, of the pub and to start negotiations with the, with the owner. Um, we, from a, from a uh, sort of uh, an operational point of view, in terms of our steering group, we're aware that we, you know, we're always looking for help and support. So, um, you know, we're a group of people that have got very busy other lives, and it's family, it's work, um, and, uh, and and we also probably realize that we want to raise our profile in terms of social media so if there are people out there that have got the uh, you know they're seeing a gap and, and feel that they can help us in that then please contact us because we're very keen to welcome new uh, doers into the into the fold to help us do what we need to do so yeah so, so yeah Yep. Thank you. So have we flyed the local areas? We've flyed uh, sort of Gosmore, the Willows, uh, some of the, the London Road area. Um, so the immediate facilities around. Um, and the other side of town. Thank you. Yes, York Road and um, areas like that. Directed uh, tar some of Tilehouse Street and uh, I think um, Tim did uh, some of Bridge Street. So we have tried to hit the locality and obviously we've had the events in the town centre in terms of pushing leaflets out. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we're, 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 we're happy to learn from uh, your experience and advice. So please, please do. Just like fast forward, you raise your half a million pounds by the pub. Um, you effectively then have got a tenant in. Is the tenant going to drive the, the strategy of the itself in terms of its open hours, what they do, how involved the community be in terms of writing? Yeah, I mean, I think that there would be a certain amount of, uh, I guess it's a balance really, I'm sure Bernard will talk from experience, where you, where the community will want to sort of have a say in the terms of the tenancy and how they see it, and obviously in the selection of the right tenant, you want someone who shares your vision, essentially, uh, and is fitting what you, you as a community want, uh, and I guess to some extent you can you can contain that within the terms of the tenancy, but also you, you obviously want to get the right person. But also, you don't want to be tying them down to, a, you know, a business model that just isn't going to work for them. So, um, yeah, you know, the, there, is a stand, there is a standard tenancy agreement that we've got in the Orleans, as well as you've got the Whitsfield Pub Association and the National Jewels Rally that put out, so you know, pub companies put in the line. So you can have a look at it. The, the, the tenancy deal that we'd be offering for this is a much, much more uh, agreeable proposition. And that's, I mean, you need that because you need to attract the tenants. You want somebody who's going to have that business, not somebody who's going to sit there and watch the business go through the door. 
So that's the comparison between the two. It works best if the community group agree on one spokesman who will discuss business matters with the tenant. And it also works best if the tenant is invited to your meetings as a courtesy, now we might not want to come on that too busy, but as a courtesy, you always say, would you like to pop in and come say, you know, you know this, Facebook and all these things can have a, a, a detrimental effect if people think, you know, you're working very hard and you're being undervalued and certain parts of the community. So it's a decent narrative set up between yeah. the two and the dialogue and a structure in place for that to happen. <coughs> Once that's in place, it usually will be. Got a question over here? Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks. A bit of a first. I'm a local councillor as well as Ian and Gordon, um, also the, the, the parliamentary candidate, which is part of them. But I'm actually hearing more of a personal capacity. It's all right, folks. You're in the right place, <laughs> Are you in contact with the guys down in Nebworth who are working with the station up down there? Because they are in exactly the same position. Yeah. Literally the same position as you. Yeah, yeah. And also, what was, if the money cannot be raised, you must get here and Area, would you be interested in doing a sort of joint project with them? And even if that money could be raised, once both projects get enough funding to be going in terms of pubs, would you be looking at doing joint supply deals with another independent pub before they're trying to set up? Is that something? That would be yeah, doing? well, we hadn't considered it, but um, we've we're, you know, we're, yeah. we're very open to, uh, to, to ideas. So. Um, yeah, we haven't. Um, we've had a little bit of contact with them. They sent us a message of support for this event, and they're, you know, they're saying they're essentially a, a little bit behind us in terms of where that. But we're very much, we're very happy to meet with them and, and share our experience. But if there are opportunities to uh, to do something together that we can't, in reality, do on our own, we're definitely up for it. Yeah. The, the other, we're very aware of that, and I had folks there, and there had been accounts written made by the developers to reinstate part of the pub as a pub. But it, when they looked at it, it was hardly functioning. It was, uh, but the other bit that you mentioned as a councillor, if the council wish, they can issue a public works loan board, and that's one way of raising the money. Because you'll get it for a very, very low rate uh, uh, to, to know the community mm -hmm. the money's spent. Mm -hmm. Public works loan board. <laughs> Here is he. <laughs> Hello. Don't let that man out of this uh, room. Answer <laughs> like a politician, sir. <laughs> Question over here. Just in the early days, I remember coming across Facebook and there was the pledging system then. Um, where are we now in terms of the previous pages? Right, thanks. Good and question. Currently, where are we at in terms yeah. of the deficit that we need to reach the bottom line? Okay, so um, I don't. So the, the first pledge is we haven't been able to quantify because we don't know how many shares people want. So those people that have already expressed an interest will need to re-express that interest and specify the number of shares they've been prepared. So it is, we, are, we are essentially running the scheme again in order to be precise. So we had about two, nearly 300 people on that register. Um, and uh, quite a sizable proportion of them I think it was around 20% indicated that they would be willing to, to invest in five or more shares. So that's, that's as far as we got in terms of getting bottoming that one out. So we now need to know exactly what, you know, what the level of potential investment is. So I will send an email out to everybody on that mailing list to, to, to state that. And it's a fairly simple process on the website, filling in the form, submitting it, and then we'll empty it into spreadsheets and such like. So question here? Um, obviously, like saying I can buy two shares for two hundred pounds is a lot different from handing you two hundred pounds and you say actually there's a risk you may never see this two hundred pounds again. Yeah. It, I mean, presumably there is that risk, isn't there? Here? Well, okay. So, good question. In terms of you know how safe is the money? We will only be taking money from people when we have <laughs> negotiated a purchase and we would perceive the sale. So you would be. You would be buying. You would be essentially becoming members of the Community Benefit Society. You would be registered for a certain number of shares, and um, and then that money will be invest will be used to purchase the property. So your your money is basically buy, helping buy that property. But wouldn't it, but wouldn't it help? I mean, obviously you've got to 
run this on the basis of a realistic um, proposal that you can confident X amount of people will stump up the cash. Yeah. Wouldn't it? I mean, is there any sort of um, any sort of guarantee you can offer prospective um, shareholders in terms of this money would only be ever used if it came to? Well, it would. Property. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. That in itself might be. Yeah. A yeah. Message if you so the share prospectus uh, is on, online. You can look at that, and the model rules where which we are governed by are also there and explain how the share system will work. Um, so your money would only be used for that purpose. And, uh, but obviously your money would then be tied up in that business and you, we won't be able to run a share scheme like, like shares are traded on the stock exchange. It doesn't work like that. It, we wouldn't be in a position to be able to uh, pay people back and, and allow shares to be exchanged until the business is up and fluid. Personally, and I wouldn't be surprised by other people wondering if actually you potentially could be entering into a transaction in the future where you're handing over money which is used to campaigning rather than purchase. No, no so the, the, the money you invest in shares for the Community Benefit Society will be used for purchase. We will also be opening up a, uh, a fight, if you like, a sort of donations for, and, and th that money would be more flexible that you know, as much as that could be used as you know as campaign to, to, to keep funding the campaign but, but I mean you know we wouldn't want to waste it it would then go into the pot to purchase if, if there's sufficient question here so yeah so if Yes, yes, yes. It's not, it's not legally binding. So potentially, people who have made that commitment could then suddenly, you know, disappear as either. Well, yeah, that, you know, that, that would be. So, so the purchase wouldn't be able to proceed until the money is there, and uh, and, and we're ready to go. If it did, we'd have to. The money would have to be returned if the purchase wasn't able to take place because of that. We know from other community benefit societies that have done similar, they haven't had that problem. In fact, they've ended up. What happens is that people tend to up their level of investment when they know it's a reality. That, that's the experience. I can't guarantee that's going to happen in the future, but that's what's happened with other community pubs. The level of final investment has exceeded what was originally... Sorry? Yeah, no, 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 no. That, 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 so we're not, yeah, we're not allowing for that. We, um, yeah, no, we can't speculate in that way. Okay, well, I guess we've probably exhausted the questions. Thank you again for bearing with us in this heat. It's been great to see you, great turnout. And so, yeah. <laughs>